Well, everybody, it is Under the Gun Plus One again, coming back at you. Last week, we had a guy who really doesn't like to be on camera. You should check that out because it was our chief marketing officer, Joe Versace. This week, I have the absolute polar opposite. He <laughs> loves to be on camera. He spent a lot of his own money putting himself on camera. He gets himself out there. He is a WSOP bracelet winner. He is a member of Team U. He is the host of the incredibly popular Run It Up series uh, here on Ultimate Poker. Jake Harver, Jason Somerville, thank you for being here so much on short notice, a late replacement. That's right. <laughs> That's right. A late, late replacement. Yeah. Exactly. I had very little notice. I had to cut weight and everything. Oh my God. How did that, how did that go for you? <laughs> it was a little rough, but I made weight and here we are. Oh, so congratulations. Thank well, you for all the kind words. That was very sweet of you. No, you've been doing an excellent job. People love the content you've been putting out. You know, I can't say I've caught all, uh, how many, like you're up to 60? 65 episodes as of today. Of it's crazy. Up. I can't say I've caught them all, but I try to catch a little bit of each one. I don't know. blame you. Just to dr get a little knowledge dropped on me once in a while. You know, it's, it's, you're giving away free stuff. Stuff, uh, free information, insights of a highly successful poker player, and like people would be crazy not to check that out, especially if you're trying to improve your game. Well, you know, here here's how I feel. I feel like people in poker for so long kind of just like disconnected the fun from the learning, and I feel like that was like really dumb. You know, how many poker training videos you watch where they're like, all right, well I'm gonna raise under the gun, and it's gonna be this, and I'm gonna three out oh, to three bet that I'm gonna just fold. It's not fun. It's boring. You know, like I think it's much more fun to have like an energy to it and to like enjoy poker because think about like what made poker great it's the cool stories it's the the Johnny Moss playing heads up outside of wherever he was playing back in the 50s and whatever you know what I mean like it's like those cool characters where there's like a entertaining story going on like oh well, all right, you get cool. entertaining things like like <laughs> last fall which is all good <laughs> but yeah like i feel like i feel like uh i don't know should we wait I don't no know. we can go oh, and we'll fix just it. do well, fixing we can, all right fix live fixing all right. We, don't, we don't edit this we'll stuff. do it live can i curse on this show absolutely oh good nice fuck it we'll do it live we will bill o'reilly style great <laughs> all right sweet so yeah but i feel like uh the fun, most fun thing for me about run it up because when i was thinking about doing it like at first i was like i don't want to make training videos on youtube because like what's the point it's not fun, you know, and you're giving it away. But and then other I was, people are doing it. Right, and I was like, uh, the idea of making training videos doesn't appeal to me. However, the idea of making uh, watch me play poker and hang out and have fun while we play poker and talk about serious poker, that seems like a cool thing. Which is what we've been doing now for like three months. So yeah. it's been awesome. And you've been very successful. You haven't just been doing this in like treading water. You know, you're up like, I think I saw your, your blog, you're like 50 BB per hour. It's was a, not, pretty, not a bad solid. result. We've done, we've done pretty good. I'm up to like, uh, after today's lack of victory, Victory, I'm afraid I'm up to like seven, 17 yes yeah, spoiler alert I'm up to like 1783 something like that from our $50 so the entire core idea of running up I started with $50 trying to turn it into $10,000 on ultimatepoker.com that's right and uh, we're up to like 1800 bucks I've done some work uh, you know but it's not a really a rush you know I'm not really trying to like get there as fast as I can get there it's a hangout come and relax and you know? you'd have to think of something else to do too when you if you got there too fast I don't want to think of anything else to do. yeah I'm but, very happy but with fifty dollars up to 10k that's like super super ambitious the what the thing that I really like about this is that you know this could have gone badly for you like you could just get like eaten up by the rake or something like that you know it turns yeah. out the micro games are like too tough and you can't beat the rake but you actually set it out there you you know, you put it up, it looks like you're on your way. And that's cool because, I mean, I think one of the, the ancillary benefits, other than just educating people, is that we can kind of go and say, like, hey, this poker thing, this you know this game of skill thing that we always keep talking about that poker is? Right. Here's a guy who just said, like, okay, he's got 50 bucks. Is it, it's not like we're going to be like, oh, he's some high-stakes gambler, so he can afford to just, you know, throw money around like crazy. We're starting with 50 bucks. Two green people, chips. Yes, two green chips. Which most people in America, they have $50, you know, for the most part. Yep. You, too, if you've got enough skill, could run this up to $10,000. That's right, which is what we're doing. Me and all the true run it up warriors out there that are on the grind every day. I'm creating this like underground circuit of run it up warriors across the world that are all learning how to play poker through run it up. They're going to be sickos. Putting people in the cage left and right, it's going to be crazy. You're making the games much harder for everybody. I might be doing that. <laughs> I might be doing that. But, you know, they're all great run it up fans. They've all been awesome. The love is awesome. People that, you know, watch these shows even a couple times a week, it's awesome. I, I'm very appreciative of being able to do something like this you know it's been pretty awesome cool and run it up's not even nearly your first attempt at, at creating poker content you know you've done you've done lots of stuff uh, you know, you've you've done the you've d did the bracelet hunting things, which are super cool. Um, you did you know did the final table. Um, yep, the final table was the first real attempt I made into mm -hmm. video making, which I finaltable.tv by the way. Uh, so 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I've always kind of liked this video making thing, but I never really thought it was going to be like what it is now where it's such a big part, part of my life. You know what I mean? Like I was like, yeah, it's kind of cool. And but I mean, when we did the final table, which was the documentary on Russell Thomas's preparation for the main event final table last year. So he contacted me to coach him. We worked for three months and we did a documentary on the last month covering his preparation to play for eight and a half million dollars. No big deal. And, uh, you know, so when we did when we when we did that and made the documentary as we were doing a training thing there was like 14 people in my house two production guys uh, you know all sorts of crazy things going on as we were trying to prepare Russ and do a documentary and it was just awesome and I loved it so that was where I first started getting into this whole like you know poker video thing also don't you feel that because you're so into poker that you kind of know what people want to see don't you kind of feel that way for sure because I mean what they don't want to see is a bunch of people doing this Right? Like, right. that's terrible. Right. And that's what we get too much of right. these days now. Even if you walk into a poker room, that's exactly what you'd watch. Right. You yeah. always, you know, anytime you're, you're playing in like the World Series, but do you ever, your non poker friends, they go like, oh yeah, I'd like to come and watch you play poker. Right. You go, oh my God, you don't. Don't, don't do that. Right. Like, no, don't. <laughs> stay at home. You know, it's, it's watch Oprah book. or something. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, there's no, you, watching live poker is a, is a horrible experience. Like, it's really very terrible. But, you know, we try to make, I always watched every single episode of like Poker After Dark when it came out. Right. I watched High Six Poker, Poker After Dark, every episode of the World Series. Did World you do that because you wanted to learn it? Did you want to do that? I just, because I loved poker. Okay. That was just it. I just loved consuming poker content. Right. So for all that stuff to go away, there wasn't really anything available out there, which was part of the reason why I thought running up on a YouTube platform made the most sense. And I mean, it's kind of come, it's kind of found its legs as we ran with it, because I never kind of set out for it to be this way when we started. But right now it's kind of awesome. Like, you know, if you're looking for a daily fun poker show in America, um, your man for the job, you know, like that's just how I feel. And I, I think like we have fun with it and, uh, and I think like, you know, it's great to see people kind of react to that because I think that people have an appetite for it or there is an appetite for it. And I'm happy to be the, you know, the, chef that providing is their appetite. I yeah. mean, I have clearly the appetite for your, your YouTube Did you like channel. that, what I did there? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a scoop because, of I mean, beans is what I did. <laughs> really? That, that, yeah. That's what the appetite is for? That's what it was, your, your, poker your beans. Your content are the beans? That's right. Okay, well, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> So this is great breaking news here from the podcast. That's right. Run it up now with more beans. Now with more beans. There you go. Yeah. That's great. Get your fiber. Uh, that's all right. Okay. All right. So we, talked, <laughs> so we talked a bit about the huh? last year's final table, of course. Now we happen to be doing this coincidentally on the eve of this year's final table. That's right. Uh, you're not coaching anybody this year. You are a, a I'm neutral. Not. I'm uh, too busy for these things. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know? Who, who wants to deal with somebody who's just going to win eight million dollars and peace right. out? Right. Like, right. But do you have any? Uh, do you have any thoughts? Like, do you have any sweat, sweats at all? Do you have anybody you like? I mean, well, what do you, you know, I uh, I think I'm a fan of JC Trans game. He is obviously a sicko and one yeah. of those first guys in poker that you're just like, oh my god, this guy is a heroic legend. And he's not just like a normal poker kid though. He just like thinks through things normally. He sees things people don't see. He's like a Negranu type or an Ivy type even, where he like understands the game in such a way that he probably couldn't even like tell you what he sees, but he's just like, I just think this guy didn't have it. And that's like one of those great skills that I really admire in poker players, much like Daniel. And I think that he's probably the only person at that final nine who really has that, you know, a level of experience, you know what I mean? For sure. And he's got all the chips too, which yeah. is also a great thing. I've played with JC and, I, and it's remarkable. I played a lot with him and it's remarkable just how often he makes the right decision. Yeah, and, you for know, sure. You just see him at the showdown and he's got the, whether he's got the best hand or the second best hand, he just made the right decision. And if you made the wrong decision, it's because often because he got cooler or something, right. or 99.99% right. of people. He, he's con just consistently good. I mean, he's also like a, a consummate professional. Like yeah. he's he. I've never seen him tilt. I've never seen him rage. Right. I've never seen him upset at anything. Like you know, he's always the kind of guy that you would you would say, wow, that guy is like consistently going to do well. And he has. Like I don't think there is a guy. There are very few guys that have a record like JC Trans so for years and years and years years he's done so well like back before I was even like I mean I think I was like 15 when JC Tran won his first tournament you know yeah. back in like the early mid 90s he was playing poker and crushing it so yep. it's great to see him do well and uh, uh, David Benefield I'm friends with I'd yeah, like to see David him do well. Director, such a great guy um, I don't know if you saw his Twitter this morning uh, but basically he said he wanted to, to 
you know, he did one when if I happen to win the bracelet, and he's a short stack, so it's a long shot, but everybody's got a shot. So according, he's a 16 to 1 long shot, according to the bet, the sports, the, the, the bookmakers, by the way. What percentage of the chips does he have? Uh, about that. Okay, <laughs> it's so like, that's, yeah. that's a little bit of an overlay. He's got like a, a yeah, I, I, a that, I think that was good. He's like a 6% according to them, which seems like too low. But anyway, go okay, ahead. So, yeah. so he said, like, he asked uh, the WSOP, like, you know what, I don't need this bracelet. Like, it's just going to sit in a deposit box. Can you just turn this into cash and donate it to the charity of my choice? Which I thought was a super cool thing to do. Mm. I mean, uh, we've already seen that before, like Peter Eastgate donating his bracelet and right. people convert. You know, the, the, that's the thing. Like, I don't understand it, but I can understand why he'd want to do it. Okay, well, fair enough. For me, I would construct a shrine. <laughs> there would be a shrine. There would be candles lit consistently. It would be a great, amazing thing. People would voyage from long distances to come visit the bracelet. Yeah. If it was me. If it were you, but I, you know, I like what he's doing though. It's much more humble. It, it is more humble, and and the fact is that how many guys you actually see wear wearing the WSOP bracelet, or even oh, uh, never. displaying it. Uh, you know, but, you know, most of the time you see a guy wearing a WSOP bracelet, you kind of think he's a fish. Right. <laughs> did you know? Did you know the story of uh, a couple years ago? Uh, Michael McDonald, aka Timex, and I came up with a friendly wager wherein we bet that over the course of the World Series of I Poker for the this. summer, right, the if one of us won a bracelet, the loser would have to win or wear the winner's bracelet, and of course pay ten thousand dollars because you know, money is money is nice too. And I just managed to bink the old one uh, K that year and managed to get Timex to wear the bracelet the entire rest of the summer. That was pretty awesome. Who, who do you think was getting the worst? Like who? Not not in terms of like. Like who was more likely to win, but like who had the most negative utility from being forced to wear the other guy's bracelet? You know, I mean, uh, I, I loved hearing the stories of Timex. Your Timex was like, oh, I get asked like 20 times a day, oh, congratulations, oh, did you win? What, what event did you win? And he has to explain every single time. So that kind of punishment, I'm a big fan of. That's great, you know what I mean? And that's worth $10,000 to me for sure. <laughs> so uh, that was great. But, uh, you know, for especially because Timex and I weren't even that good of a friends back in the day. It was like one of those things we just happened to do because that's what poker players do yeah yeah you know? no it totally is but uh, you know getting back on the subject david benefield oh, great yes. guy i'll be cheering for him tonight you know hope hope he uh runs it up or runs up a stack and if that's he, right he's one of these guys if he doubles through he's be super dangerous right super dangerous yeah for sure it'll be fun um you are a huge UFC fan, probably the only guy it's around us. Ultimate Poker who's as big a UFC fan as me. And this That's is right. a big month for the UFC. Lots of big events. This this Wednesday is the Tim Kennedy against yeah, against uh, Nadal, right? Yep. Is this Wednesday, and then this weekend is Henderson Vitor in, yeah, in Brazil. Brazil, and then next week is obviously UFC 167. GSP fight. Hendricks. Monstrous fight. Oh yeah, I'm what, excited what do you like about for that. that fight, by the way. I, I I'm on the Johnny Hendricks underdog bandwagon, but I feel like. I've bet against GSP so many times and paid the price for it over I've, and over. I've never bet against GSP. <laughs> I even got wrecked on GSP when Matt Sauer beat him and I lost. And I was like, oh, oh. I was like, oh, GSP is nine to one favorite. GSP is going to have to get knocked out by walking up the steps and tripping. That's what I thought. Turns out Matt Sauer could actually knock him out as well. He so actually I, hits kind of hard, as it turns out, Matt. Sauer. Actually, it's kind of hard. <laughs> so uh, I had to learn my lesson and paid that price. But you know, GSP is a great monster. And the best thing about GSP, from a betting point of view, is that he just wrestles. Yeah. Like you know what. He He's gonna he's do. Not gonna mess around. You know what he's gonna do. He's never gonna go in there and rashad it up and just like start throwing punches against Tiago Silva or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? Like GSP is great to bet on. He's like John Fitch because he just gets it done. He's just going into wrestle. Like you know, and unless Johnny Hendricks can stop him, I John think John Fitch not so great to bet on as of late. As of late, <laughs> as of late, and I lost money against Hendricks from Fitch okay. too. I had like 10k on Fitch and he just got one punch knocked out three <laughs> seconds later. It was actually not even a sweat for you. It, it, it was actually it was actually that that fight happened just after I met my current boyfriend and I was like yeah I got like 10k on this guy I think he's gonna <laughs> out wrestle him and literally like four seconds later it was like bam out and then he was like so there goes 10,000 huh and I'm like yep that's what you do your boyfriend doesn't does he do does he do understand like betting and gambling uh, he understands sort of world he understands before he met you yeah he didn't before he met me but he gets it now yeah. also you know it's you know I do my own thing yeah he as long as he can afford his supply of shoes and clothes he'll <laughs> not ask questions which is how I like it so that's fine fair enough let's talk about that a little because obviously uh, you attracted a lot of attention when you became the first openly gay yeah you know, yeah yeah we're, we're gonna talk about this but but there are people out there who don't know this about you uh, 
you know, who are over in Ultimate Poker Land. And, the three and of you that don't know, now you know. That's well, right. you might, they, the, the three of you who, who may not have known who you are before. But, yeah, yeah. But no, it's true. Here's the, th here's the thing. You, you were received with, with what I perceive to be, I don't know, this is your perception, like really positively. I think the poker world just, just reacted really well to it. Yeah, for right? sure. And was that something you were scared of going into it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like I've grown a lot since then because if you even go back and look at like my videos from like two years ago, I was a much different person back then than I was now because I was much more closeted, generally speaking, with everything because I never really wanted to go out or do anything fun or really just relax or be myself because I was always afraid of being myself in situations. But you just can't be. It's just such a stupid way to live your life. And now that I've destroyed those barriers, you can see the difference, like for sure. You know, I mean, I, I just put too many restrictions on myself of like anxieties and I wore this mantle of anxiety everywhere I went of like, oh my God, if I was ever public about anything I felt, people would always hate me and discard me and I was going to be some branded, some sort of like radical, crazy, like, it was all insane, like, or relatively insane. It was like I built myself a cage of anxiety that I just happily lived in for 24 years. Crazy. Crazy to do that kind of thing. But uh, I can keep a good secret, though. That's for sure. <laughs> That's clearly true. Clearly, if you have a secret to tell me, dearjcarver at gmail.com. So anyway. we've gone from cages of anxiety to scoopfuls of beans. Like, yes. The, the scoopfuls of beans are way better. Way better. Yeah, beans are much more healthy than cages. <laughs> Especially you know, if you're... Brought to you by ultimatepoker.com. Wisdom. If you're fighting cages, that, that's particularly better. Yes, yeah. for sure. For sure. But yeah, I mean, it's been great. You know, I mean, like it was a little, uh, you know, I was, I was certainly massively anxious in the years heading up to that moment. But it took a while for me to like grow and I took a non-traditional path to getting to where I had to be. If I was just a normal old kid and I went to college and I was with other people that were going through a similar thing or even just right. out, then I would have been like, oh, they're out and no one hates them massively. Then I would have come out, I'm sure, very quickly after that. But and then it would have, have been a thing. Examples of that. In the poker world. No, no, no. Yeah. There were no examples in poker and there were no examples in my personal life because the places that I lived in and went to, it had no sorts of examples like that and my parents were very conservative. So it was kind of like an environment that just didn't allow me to really be myself. But as time eventually went on, I kind of realized that putting myself in this cage was not going to lead to long-term happiness and that even if at first I just kind of accepted that it would be worse in some ways but ultimately better in the long run to just come out when in fact it was just like entirely better in every single way do you expect that like your your example like you'll be that guy that other people were looking for for, uh, for other gay men in, in the poker world uh, i mean like you know do i expect that to happen i mean no not really i mean i i would predict that it probably will happen at time to time but i've been very i've been very firm on the whole fact that every single thing that i did was for me you know what i mean like any kind of consequence that people were inspired or anything like that that's great and awesome and i'm very very appreciative that that could be a thing, but I never want to pretend that I was like, I'm leading the charge. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, yeah. like, let's get out of the closet now. You yeah. know, like it's, it's a party. No. <laughs> clearly, clearly, <laughs> like, and that's the way to be. Like to just kind of do things for yourself. Right. And, like let the let the ancillary benefits, or let the extra benefits just kind of spill over. Right. I, I think that the current model, the current model for gay men in America is the Glenn Greenwald, the Nate Silver, the guys that are just accidentally gay, coincidentally gay, that there are these guys who are like genius titans of their industries or their professions and there's no mention to be made except for the fact like when Glenn Greenwald's partner gets arrested in the UK and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Like, I think like, that... Like, oh, I didn't know he was gay. Oh, that's interesting. I guess he's just like... Right, because it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. It really makes no right. difference. Right. You know what I mean? There's no, you know, there's no difference. Like, and for the world to have viewed people like that for so long is just wrong, obviously. And we're evolving as a society obviously to a point where like it doesn't make a difference what does it matter if your mechanic is gay who cares you can know let him my car right <laughs> right is so it gonna yeah right you know or in your who... case can he you know does he know how to play like jacks on like a nine high right yeah high it doesn't it doesn't matter yeah. it just doesn't make a difference and i think everyone generally would be happier in life if you could just pursue your own happiness and, and freedoms and do your own thing that's just my opinion but i feel like generally speaking tolerance can never be a bad thing even if you're the most generic white American straight, you know, 40 something year old, every person wants something a little bit weird or wants to pursue some sort of passion or hobby or whatever. Do it, go crazy, do your own thing. Isn't that the kind of world we want to live in anyway? Absolutely. Right? Well said.
this is why we have this man on here. That's right. So we can we can entertain you. It was like extra. some some wisdom with your beans is what we're saying <laughs> so, here. Wi some wisdom with your beans, and <laughs> also, you know, another th another thing about you here is that you know you're you're just doing it. You're out there at the pinnacle of your profession. You're creating all this content. You're you're having fun with it. Like it's it's this uh, is a blast for you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've always listen. When I was when I was when I was younger, I got very sick. When I was like 19 and 20, I was very sick for two two years, like two months of two years back to back. And uh, when I got better, I said to myself, like, fuck, man, like, I don't want to just, I, I want to spend my time doing something that I enjoy. That was the beginning of the coming out process. That was the beginning of professional poker for me. I was just going to school and fucking hating it. I hated it. I love that quote on your, on your, uh, on your blog. What's that? You, you, so like, uh, on your, sorry, I guess on your website. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where you, where you wrote Jasonsummerville.com, by the way. That, that's the one. That's the one. Um, where, anyway. you, where you said that you, like, you're not a, uh, uh yeah. gambler with a, yeah. you're, you're a college <laughs> student with a gambling problem, but you were Turned out, I was a gambler with a college problem. Turns well out. <laughs> well said. See, I, I, I got like a slightly lucky because I'm just I'm a few years young, I'm a few years older than you rather. And when I was in college, like online poker had not really quite hit an actual thing yet. But there's no way I would have graduated school if online poker was oh, a yeah. thing then. Like back then, you couldn't like multi-table. You had one site to play on. Right, right. Like so I ended up actually graduating with a degree, which I now hang on my wall and. My right. parents are happy about. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares? Mine would be too. Yeah. <laughs> but you decided you 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 made that decision. You're just like screw this. Poker's better than school. That's well. I mean, look. Like I I gave it a lot of thought, and I it was like a combination of things that had happened. One big thing being that I was very sick, and I didn't want to spend my time going and doing something that I really disliked. Yeah. Like I was going to like a business college. I was getting good grades, but I was literally going to school and playing poker in class. What's the point? What's the point? I was making like thousands of how, how sick were you? Were you like very like deathbed? Uh, no, like, but I mean like I mean like I had I, I had ulcerative colitis, so I guess okay. I still have technically. So, um, but I got really sick and didn't know what it was. I went from like 155 pounds to like 128 pounds oh, in like, you're like a what? month. You're like almost six feet tall, right? Like, uh, no, no, no. Like I'm like five, five, five nine on a good okay. day. Uh, good day. But 120 pounds is not what a five foot nine man should weigh. No, for regardless. sure. Like in, in a month, or not like, a five foot nine woman should weigh. Right, 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 right. In a month, it was like crazy. So, uh, so. I I kind of just like once I got better and I remember very 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 clearly I remember being bedridden and just thinking to myself oh my god I want a fucking cannoli right now I never had a cannoli in my life and I never actually even had one but I remember I remember wanting one so badly as like the dream of being able to leave the house which I couldn't even do when I was really that sick like I had this dream of actually it was a calzone that's what it was I had never had one of those either but it was like you, you didn't know the difference between a calzone and a cannoli that's and I extent. live in Long Island that's in the New York which that's right that's right but uh, but you know I just felt like I just felt like I really wanted to just like get out of the house and do something and have and just have fun and I've I've always wanted to spend my time in a way that was exactly what I wanted to do and it's a very kind of like spoiled bratish to want that but I think it's a reasonable thing like and I think that working towards setting your time to say that I'm gonna spend my time doing exactly what I want to do and I'm gonna have a blast doing it that's a good ideal to work towards can we do it every day no we can't but we can try right absolutely. One of your very best friends in the poker world, Mr. Dan O'Brien. Yes. Uh, you, know, you roll your eyes. I roll my eyes, but it's true. Yeah. It's not, yeah. He has he has said that you know we we both love MMA. He's one of these guys who thinks that because he's an athletically gifted guy, uh -huh. that he would be <laughs> able to beat you in a fight, even if you had a six month training head start and he just sat there, you know, whatever, doing his regular thing. You know, you could be out there grappling, doing your jiu jitsu, flexing your boxing, your Muay Thai, and... Dan thinks he can just tough guy it out. Exactly. Um, by the way, for further context, uh, Dan once got drunk at the PCA and also thought he could beat me in a fight. After That's right. A certain I was there for that, actually. So, Keith Herring so was there also. We have two people huh? on this particular program, both of whom the Dan challenge. Thinks he can beat up. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So this is a very interesting thing to us. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I think we both, you and I both agree. Clearly, you would crush him, clearly, for sure, because Dan has no grappling, and he's got like eight knee surgeries. Like Dan's like half machine, like Darth Vader style from like the waist below. So like I, I don't think Dan could 
any real legitimate shot at ever winning in a fight that was true MMA. Now, you could maybe set some sort of a rule set up where like you could only punch, it was like a boxing match, and then maybe... But even still, if you boxed for six uh, months, if all yeah, you did was right. box for six months... like he, the, That's the, the insane thing. Is that the stipulation is he, he's going to sit there and just do his regular thing and, you know, play right. sports. And so active, Dan's, Dan's challenge was that Dan said that he thought that I could that I could train six months of fighting training and that Dan could do nothing besides do his little workouts with his little weights and run around in some rocks or whatever it is that he does. And that Dan thought that he could do all this and then still beat me six months later. And that it wouldn't even be close. And I just said, like, listen, maybe you'd still win. But it wouldn't be, like, a blowout. You know, get out of here. I, I fought enough times in my teenage youth with uh, in a karate school that at least I went, I went to karate six days a week. You know what I mean? And I fought probably two or three of those days. Even if you're only fighting 17-year-olds, what has Dan ever fought? Besides, like, you know, the desire to have a Coca-Cola. You know what I mean? Like, Dan, Dan has no idea what he's getting into here. And I really root for Dan O'Brien to win some money so that I can make a bet and fight Dan. Yeah. Next question. And, no, uh, go ahead. no, I mean, this, this is the thing, like, you, you've been to karate school, you've been punched in the face, I've been punched in the face. If you've never been punched in the face before, and the first time you're ever punched in the face is when somebody's doing it for real, it turns out it might not go all that well. Listen, I'm sure somebody's punched Dan in the face before, right? I mean, I would just bet, I would just bet that that's happened. Just knowing him. Uh, uh, it's hard to imagine that Dan's avoided being punched in the face his entire life. But if he somehow hasn't, you know... I find it hard to believe. It, it is really hard because, I mean, you, you sometimes you, I don't know how much like really low level amateur fighting you've watched, but I've watched a fair bit over the years and sometimes you just see a guy get in the ring and you just think, how in the hell did somebody let this guy or girl Fight, right. get into the ring? Because like as soon as they get hit, they turn their back, they cower and it's just right. a nightmare from there and they're just clearly unprepared. Out, outclassed, but, right. but people don't understand that, that like MMA, it's a skill sport. Like nobody is just going to go out there and be like, yeah, I could go, you know, dunk on like guys in the NBA or something like that. Right, it's insane right, to, right. to think that, you know, even, even if you just took somebody who was like a, a regular golfer or something like that, not even somebody good, but you said like, oh, I've never golfed before, but I'm an athletic guy, so yeah, I can hit the ball farther and put it in the hole more, he's better than you. Right. Like, no, it's not going to happen, but right. it seems to happen with fighting because there's so much ego involved in fighting. Oh, yeah, it just seems like it's so like easy. Yeah, yeah right. Those guys on TV. But I mean, yeah. like, and the truth of the matter is, like, if Dan and I just, like, fought right now, like, I, I think Dan would be a favorite, obviously, partially because he has, like, 60 pounds on me or something crazy. But uh, okay, maybe not 60, but it's a lot. You know, keep eating those those ho hos, Dan. But uh, you know, <laughs> I feel I feel like oh, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a text about this video. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. If, if that expedites the fight, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm only You're here to play the role, here. role of antagonist. You're yeah. Joe Silva. I, I am the ultimate gaming Joe Silva. I'm only here to be an antagonist. Okay. I want this to happen. I see now. And We're gonna... I want to bet money that, that you can beat him up. Although hey. I'm sort of tipping my hand here a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. But, you know, <laughs> hey, I, I'm with you. Listen, you know, I think uh, I think it would be fun, but, you know, Dan's got some work to do. We'll let him make some money over there, hopefully win a tournament, and then, you know, he's got my number when the time, when the time is so right. So you wouldn't have a problem, like, punching your good friend in the face? Because I actually would no, enjoy. no. Uh, I would probably pay for the privilege of punching Dan from time to time. Actually, oh, there you go. Like, That's really, true. Just really hard in there, and like you know, you're on top. I don't want to hurt now. him. I don't want to hurt him. But you know, so you'd, I would you'd be the one of these guys looking up at the ref, going, "Could you stop this already?" Like, I, I would be like, "Can't you see he's crying?" You know, I mean, come on, like you know, let's end this here. But you know, I, listen, Dan. Dan's a tough guy. He's got some athleticism in there, but you know, push comes to shove. I don't know. You'd be able. Cool. Tell us what else is coming up uh, in Jay Carver land, you know, content wise, anything wise, anything you, you want to tease before we wrap this puppy up? Well, let me just tell you that as of, as of right now, today, as of the second before we started the show, we were at 9,970 something subscribers, very close to 10,000, which is a YouTube barrier that I have been very excited to break for some time now. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a 10,000 subscriber celebration, we're doing this crazy awesome promotion where people are going to be I'm, I'm personally flying two Run It Up fans to Las Vegas to come to the Hall of Fame they UFC can be from poker anywhere game. In the world. One person from anywhere in the world, one person from New Jersey because we're moving to New Jersey, so it's something hey, tied in it. with Jersey. That it. makes sense, right? And we're gonna fly these people in. We're gonna be my guests for the weekend. We're gonna go to the UFC Hall of Fame game with Royce, with uh, Hoist Gracie, Forrest Griffin, Chuck Liddell. Who else is in that game? There's like a crazy Matt Hughes, Matt Hughes and uh, Bruce Buffer will be there. Lots of UFC people will be there. Very next day, we're gonna play a sit and go at Red Rock. Me, Ultimate Poker Pros maybe even you. And then we're coming to UFC 167, two, you two and me. How crazy is this? 
how do you get all to do all this like sex shit? Like that's so unfair. Just because you're like Mr. Outgoing, look at me. I produce content. That's right. You get to go to every guy. Because I scoop show. the beans, damn it. You scoop the beans. I'm here, <laughs> I'm here you know, scraping huh? the, you know, the yeah. bottom of the barrel. All I do is, is slave away in this office, and you're you're handing out golden beans. You gotta beans you gotta watch golden. more run it up. So they're golden beans. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey, you know, listen. I I I I had a theoretical breakthrough maybe like a month ago where if I had to say let's say I have a person, let's say a person is like 15 years old and he said to you, hey, Terrence, give me a skill that will carry me through the rest of my life where I can follow my passions wherever they may lead me. The skill that I think you could give this person that would be the best suited to be super versatile is to be good on camera. It's true. If you're good on camera, you can do anything, anything you want to do. You like to knit, you can be good on camera and knit, be a good on camera while you knit and you can do whatever you want to do. It's just true. You can even be president of the United States if you're very exactly good. Exactly. And you know the right people. Right. Well, you know, it's a little bit tough, but I'm sure. But basically, it requires being good on camera. It's true. It's true. This Lessons been, for the kids at home. <laughs> this has been Jason Somerville. He has been incredibly entertaining under the gun plus one. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Check us out. You know, leave our comments on the YouTube channel or on Twitter. Uh, really appreciate having you guys once again. This guy is awesome. Thank you, sir, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Have a good one, guys, and I'll see you next time on Under the Gun Plus One. Peace!